uh, passionate about personally, and, and I know, uh, based on the show of hands I just saw, I know many of you are in, involved in this uh, industry that, in my mind, is going under some very uh, profound metamorphosis and upheaval right now, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the things I'd really uh, like to dwell on. Uh, if I can end my talk on that subject, and hopefully a lot of the discussion that we have afterwards, I'll save a little time at the end uh, to make sure that uh, we have time to, uh, uh, to discuss that in some detail, if, if, if you would like, what, the, what I think the future holds. But let me get there uh, by uh, kind of starting with, the, the, with my own kind of journey. Uh, as you uh, just heard, when I, when I launched this last October, I actually became, uh, you know, uh, maybe what I would describe as a, I like the term, private astronaut. Um, officially, my increment, for which I was only the only person on this particular increment, my, I was called a visiting crew 15. That was the I was the 15th short duration crew member uh, or a, a crew cycle on board the International Space Station. But if you really back up and said, you know, you, you've already heard uh, mentioned in the introduction there that I was uh, that I've done uh, my mundane business has been in the area of, of computer games. I've also done a lot of exploration around the Earth. Uh, but I really think of myself as fundamentally as a storyteller. The, the kinds of things that I am motivated to do with my studies, with my exploration, with my activities, is to then come back and share them with people, and whether it's creating uh, virtual worlds to go explore, or uh, sometimes physical things to explore at my home in Austin, uh, I think of myself really fundamentally as a storyteller. And that really comes out of a combination of my parents. You already heard that my father uh, was a NASA astronaut. Uh, my mother, by the way, is a professional artist. And, uh, and in my case, I have a little bit of both the right and left brain. I'm, I'm kind of, whereas my siblings, I can peg as being most like one of my parents. I'm really right down the middle. And that combination of high tech and art, I think, is what made me, uh, you know, created me to you know, be at the at the right place, at the right time, and with the what I call the perfect storm of of uh, personality traits and interests to do high tech art or computer games. I really think of computer games as the quintessential high tech art. And uh, when I started in computer games, it was really at the very beginning of computers. Uh, the thing I'm best known for is a series of games called Ultima that go back to literal you know, stick figures, uh, but then evolved to you know, very high-end uh, 3D graphics. Um, that was kind of like what I call the first era of my career. The second era was in online gaming. I'm actually often credited as the person who created the first what's called massively multiplayer online game where people from around the world all play together online, and for the last 10 years has been the dominant segment of gaming. Um, and, uh, and even if you look outside of what I'll call my professional career and you go just into my, my, my home life, so to speak, even my home, which is just a, you know, a little ways away here in Austin, Texas, is really a, a vehicle for storytelling. You know, inside, you, well, you saw on that previous slide, the observatory on top of my home, while the inside is equally kind of, which you might call wacky, uh, you know, I've got uh, indoor waterfalls, indoor artificial rain, uh, secret passageways throughout the house. So there's a dungeon underneath my house. Uh, the house is filled with some unusual things. I've got lots of historical artifacts, of course, a growing space artifact collection, and of course, my dungeon is full of all kinds of dead things. Um, you know, when you think of these explorations that I've done uh, down at Titanic and Antarctica, etc., uh, you know, one of the things I did learn from my father is that you know, if you get one of those rare opportunities to go into uh, a, 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 a an uncommonly visited part of the Earth, you know, you don't, you remember the we all kind of grew up probably with the Boy Scout adage of you know, uh, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints. But in my household, we had one extra one, which was you know, if you're going to place some place of scientific in interest that people haven't uh, had the chance to go to very often, what a shame it would be not to bring back scientific samples. Uh, and so I did that all the time. With all the times I've done these uh, fairly exotic uh, travels, I've gone uh, and done as much research as I could on those trips, and, as, and very commonly actually built businesses or products out of the things that we sampled uh, while on those trips. For example, uh, when we went down to hydrothermal vents, we brought up novel extremophile uh, bacterial life forms from, when we, from which we extracted novel proteins, which we actually market. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's an example of one of the kind of, uh, you know, started as, as exploration, went into science, and then ultimately became a business. And, you know, another thing I kind of grew up with, and I think probably a lot of people in this community could, uh, would feel this way, is, you know, I, I grew up believing, you know, kind of everybody went to space. You know, they, you know, when I was a kid, not only was my father, of course, actually going to space, but uh, my right-hand next-door neighbor was Joe Engel, another shuttle-era astronaut. 
My left hand next to our neighbor is Hoot Gibson, another astronaut. Over my back fence, another astronaut. So, you know, literally all my physical neighbors uh, were astronauts, and the ones beyond them were all folks like yourselves, uh, or many of you here, you know, the prime contractors involved in putting people into space. And so I just kind of grew up thinking that that was normal. And it wasn't until I went to the University of Texas that I met what I used to call these Sesame Street people uh, that had all the real normal jobs, like butcher, baker, and fireman, uh, which I always thought was a fantasy. And, uh, but it was actually a NASA doctor at about the age of 13 who noticed that my eyesight was going bad, and he said, you know, hey, Richard, you know, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but you are now no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And while, you know, before that, I would have never said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a NASA astronaut. But once I was told I couldn't be a NASA astronaut, I was like, wait a minute. You know, first of all, I'm kind of pissed that you've kind of now told me I'm no longer eligible to be a member of the club that my family and all my friends are members of. And then I also went into, like, you know, who are you to define who has access to space or not? Or not? And I said, well, you know, if I can't go through this, you know, government official program, I'm just going to have to bring a private space agency into existence. You know, and at the age of 13, you don't realize how effectively impossible it is. Uh, and so it took me, you know, 30 years to pull it off. But I've literally, since about the age of 13, been devoted to exactly that. And I started by investing in things like SpaceHab. I know a lot of you probably either work with or are very familiar with SpaceHab. Um, you know, SpaceHab's original business plan uh, included uh, putting basically a double-decker bus in the back of the shuttle payload bay to carry passengers, and that's what I was investing in. Um, of course, they never pulled that off. And, uh, uh, but eventually, I did find a group of entrepreneurs who did pull it off. There's a group of us uh, that started the X Prize, which many of you might be familiar with, where we funded a $10 million prize for the first uh, privately uh, funded suborbital space plane. We started a company called Zero G Corp, which does uh, parabolic flights uh, into microgravity. And we started Space Adventures, which was originally going to sell seats on suborbital space planes, but we eventually uh, uh, thought that was going too slow, so we jumped right in and, and started sending people to orbit. And, and so I've just, uh, this, uh, you know, a year ago, October, became the sixth private citizen to fly in space. It's also interesting to note that I was originally scheduled to be the first, uh, but tragically in 2001, that was when the internet stock market bubble burst. Uh, and so I actually had to sell my seat to Dennis Tito. So Dennis Tito became the first, but literally uh, that was originally scheduled to be, to be me. Uh, still, I did uh, still become the first uh, you know, father and son American team. I actually flew with Sergei Volkov, who became, uh, during the same flight, the first father-son Russian team. So we kind of uh, ushered in the uh, second generation of, of space flight together. And I committed to that flight. I, you know, I flew in 2008, but of course, uh, you know, I've been working on this for decades, and I specifically committed to this particular flight in early 2007. But just because you want to go, and even if you are flying privately and can afford to pay your own ticket price, you still have this yet another major hurdle called uh, you know, not only training but medical qualification because space flight is considerably harder on your body than, uh, uh, than, than living here behind a desk at home. Uh, and uh, so any medical uh, anomaly is uh, potentially a non-starter for, for travel in space. And I actually have two very... <coughs> I have two very serious issues. One is I have two fused kidneys on the left-hand side of my body. <coughs> pardon me again. And, uh, and it turns out just by good luck, and pardon me if I use a cough drop here, but I've got a little cough when I get rid as well. But fortunately for me, they'd already flown an astronaut previously who had the same condition, but they didn't know it at the time that he flew because they didn't have technology to detect it back in those days. They didn't have CT scans. But I also had another thing called a liver hemangioma. Uh, and that was more serious, and I actually had to go under, undergo, you know, major life-threatening surgery to have one sixth of my liver removed, or they wouldn't let me fly. And so, having spent 30 years in pursuit of this, I wasn't about to let the whole thing like life-threatening surgery stand in the way. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, I now bear that nice 12-inch uh, scar as a kind of memento of, of my preparation for space flight. One of the first things I did too when you when I got into Russia to start training is they uh, mold a seat liner in, for the, in the Soyuz to fit your body. And so that's uh, one of my favorite shots there of uh, the beginning of training, <coughs> where they're literally immersing you in plaster of Paris, letting it dry, and then using a crane to you know, kind of suck you up out of the plaster once it's dry. Uh, you know, I've, uh, uh, the Soyuz training I've gone through is the same as uh, what's called the user level, the first level of, of training that all astronauts and cosmonauts uh, go through. 
Um, you know, we did all the same high fidelity simulations. I uh, also went through the similar kind of training on the International Space Station systems, mostly on the Russian side, but also on the safety equipment on the US side. You know, one of the most fun parts of training, of course, is zero-G flights. Any of, the, any of you who have not done those, since they are commercially available, and of course I'm part of the company, so you can take this uh, as a sales pitch if you'd like. But, uh, but it really is, but you know, well, Robert's been on it, I mean, Robert can actually say this is a, just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, experience that uh, I heartily recommend for everyone. You know, one of my least favorite parts about the beginning of, or, of the year that I spent training in Russia was the fact that, uh, you know, I was training on a, basically a, what used to be a secret Russian military base uh, that we now go train in. And, and the food, while the food there is very fresh and very high quality, uh, you know, you're basically eating in a military commissary, and uh, the food that you get served is basically the same meal, every meal of every day. In fact, those four pig, I started taking pictures of my food when I realized it wasn't changing. In fact, some of those dishes are breakfast, and the only way you can tell is there's hard-boiled eggs sitting next to the plate. Um, you know, we did the outdoor uh, survival training, and the, actually the hardest part of training is actually sea survival training. It's kind of a rite of, a rite of passage. It's sort of a, uh, they, they make it um, partic particularly arduous. It's sort of seen as a, uh, you know, if, if you can, it's clearly something solvable, but it's definitely going to be miserable. It's definitely going to hurt. Um, and uh, uh, but they kind of put everybody through it just to you know see if you're uh, you know tough enough to stick it out. And then after that, um, even after I passed all my individual exams, uh, we then had to go train as a as an integrated crew. Uh, and even as a crew, we had to pass a set of exams uh, both for on board the space station as well as in Soyuz operations uh, before uh, we were all allowed to graduate and officially uh, you know be called a a, a, a true crew. And so this is the crew that I launched with. That's Yuri Lonchakov in the middle, Russian cosmonaut, and American Mike Fink that I know many of you know uh, there on the right. Uh, both of whom, these two, both these guys are just really phenomenal uh, individuals as well as uh, phenomenal astronauts. You know, another one of my favorite things about uh, Russian traditions, uh, you know, is they have, they have lots of uh, what you can either call superstitions and or traditions, a little bit of both. And one of the ones I really enjoyed was the planting of a tree on the, the uh, uh, this LA where every cosmonaut who has launched out of Baikonur, starting with Gagarin, has planted a tree. So and one end of this whole LA is, you know, Gagarin's mighty oak, and at the other end is, you know, my little baby, hopefully still surviving, sapling. And, you know, I don't know how many of you know that training, uh, we, we don't do this in the United States anymore, but we used to, and the Russians still do, uh, and they try to decrease your uh, susceptibility to motion sickness in space by putting you in a rotating chair. Uh, and you do this, you know, as the, as the flight gets close, you do it, uh, you know, it used to be one, at the beginning of the training, it's only once a week, but by the end of training, it's every day. And I gotta tell you, it is a pretty miserable part of the day when you realize, uh-oh, my next class is to go sit in the rotating chair and only stop if and when, if and when you're about to be sick. Uh, because, first of all, it means you're guaranteed to get to the threshold of being sick. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you do that, uh, the rest of the day is pretty miserable. But, uh, but at least for me, you know, I did uh, go from just being able to do it for two minutes at the beginning to 15 minutes, which is the max I'll let you do at the end. And I did not uh, have any motion sickness in space. So with a sample of one, maybe it works. Um, you know, a couple days before launch, you get a rescue briefing. And this is one of the times when, uh, you know, it really was impressed upon me just the, the level of effort that it takes to operate one of these flights. I mean, they had a, you know, many thousands of people, military units deployed downrange. Uh, you know, if you have a pad aboard, there's one area you might end up in. They've got helicopters and rescue vehicles. If you've got a first stage aboard another area, second stage aboard another area, third stage aboard another area. First orbit, if you had an abort because of a uh, lack of being able to retain pressure, there's one other swath across Kazakhstan you might end up. Then they have a second orbit abort, and then after that, they presume you're probably going to stay in space for a while, so that's the, kind of the end of where these, these rescue groups grow. But it's just an enormous amount of people deployed uh, downrange, just in case, uh, that's only been used once in history. But another thing that was pretty interesting to note was, you know, here we are 48 hours prior to launch, and my space, my rocket, has not even been assembled. It's literally in pieces. The first, uh, second, and third stages are literally in pieces in one building, separately, you know, not, not even bolted together. And the orbital module uh, that has just had a fairing put around it and the ejection tower mounted to it is actually an entire other building. 
And so 48 hours, in, in, the, in the final 48 hours of countdown, you know, you're sitting there going like, man, I, I hope they have not only enough time to put it together, but hopefully test it. You know, because you're going like, it, it, it just seems really counterintuitive that they, can, that they have this down to where they can pull this off. But by the way, the Russians do this, the, the Soyuz operations like clockwork. I mean, I, I, was, I was incredibly impressed with the speed, efficiency, and reliability of their ability to you know, turn and burn with the, with the Soyuz. It was only the day before that they rolled the vehicle out to the launch pad and uh, you know, stand it up and uh, uh, prepare it for fueling. And even, you know, if you, and just, a, just as a different, as a, as a comment on uh, how what I would call open to commercial activity the Russians are, one of the experiments I did in space that I'll talk a little bit more about later was something called protein crystal growth. And I had to take a frozen experiment on board the rocket about four hours prior to launch. And so we were prepared to have them basically say no, or there'd be some real incredible difficulty with pulling this off. And we came in and explained what we wanted to do and said we needed access to the vehicle and we'd want to you know, have somebody, uh, we'd want to take this thing out of a freezer and carry it up and bungee cord it in on the habitation module four hours prior to launch. And they went, okay. You know, it was literally, it was, okay, yeah, that's what we need, that's what we'll do. I mean, it literally was, there was no red tape, there was no, uh, you know, no difficulties, it was just, uh, we understand it, we've seen the experiment, we're familiar with it, uh, yeah, of course, if that's what you want to put on board, we'll, we're happy to do it. And um, it was always just a fascinating, um, you know, commentary just about the ease of, of operations. And then finally, uh, you know, on the 12th of October, after training for about a year, you know, it's a mighty good day when you, when you wake up in the morning, you put on your own custom-made space suit. Uh, you know, you go out to this fully fueled rocket, and you know, unlike in the U.S., where no one except the white, uh, the, you know, a small group is in the, uh, you know, the closeout crew is near the, the orbiter, and everybody else is miles away. In this case, my father, my personal film crew, uh, a little band, uh, a bunch of military officials, we're all right there at the base of the rocket. You know, it's clapping hands and waving goodbye. You know, as we climbed on board squeeze inside this tiny, tiny, tiny claustrophobic little capsule uh, and uh, you know, waited for our last few hours and then finally uh, you know, took the eight and a half minute ride into space. Uh, just a phenomenal experience. You know, the, the launch on a Soyuz is completely different than I had anticipated. You know, I expected it to be noisy. I expected it to have a lot of vibration. Uh, but in fact, it was effectively perfectly silent. Absolutely no vibration. It was very difficult to tell that the engines were in fact operational. Um, and it felt uh, much more like a confident ballet move lifting you into the sky uh, than it did, for example, like dropping the clutch at a you know, green light in a Ferrari. Uh, it was really a very uh, comfortable, uh, calm, kind of serene experience as you slowly picked up G-forces uh, to about three and a half, four and a half Gs. And uh, uh, that was only interrupted when we staged, which was still just a relevant speaking subtle events. Uh, on your way to orbit. On my way up, I couldn't help but do it in my computer gaming way. That's a that's actually a secret message that in our in our logbooks I knew when the camera would be on me, and so on the back of the page that told me that that's when the camera would be on, I put a secret message to uh, uh, to my gaming uh, friends. Uh, that's a, a, a symbolic language from my last game that says um, this. What does it say? Earth is the cradle of uh, humanity, but one cannot live in the cradle forever, which is a quote by a, a Russian uh, uh, who is, is commonly considered the father of, of modern rocketry, uh, and whose name is Sokovsky. And what's interesting is when the, when the vehicle first rolled over and I got the look back at the Earth, what's interesting is my first view, my first thought was not, wow, how beautiful the Earth is, or anything of that nature. My true, honest first thought when I looked back down at the Earth was, Wow, we're really not that high up. I sure hope we're in a perfectly circular orbit, or we're going to be re-entering again in just a few minutes, and that's not going to be good. And, uh, and of course, you are in a perfectly circular orbit. Uh, but uh, but those of you who know the orbital mechanics of uh, space flight uh, uh, well understand that you know if uh, you know down to the Earth is you know half a meter or so, uh, you know the the distance uh, the ISS is orbiting above the surface of the Earth is you know, is just a few multiples of the. There are 20 multiples of the height of clouds that you go outside and look up at. And so it's, uh, you're really just skimming right around the, the surface of the Earth. It's uh, really quite impressive. But of course, I'm also pretty happy that I'm there. Um, and some of you may also know that uh, 
uh, once you achieve orbit, they still take about uh, somewhere between 24 and 48 hours to rendezvous with the International Space Station. You don't want to accidentally collide with it, so you insert to an orbit that is near but not threateningly near. You check out your systems on board the Soyuz. We lived on board the Soyuz for two days, and then you slowly and carefully uh, rendezvous with the ISS. You know, when you talk about space adaptation illnesses, there was a vestibular style motion sickness that I didn't fall prey to, but I did fall prey to the second really common way that people feel poorly in space, which is commonly referred to as fluid shift. It feels like you're lying head down on a slide. And if you imagine hanging upside down, and if you hang upside down for a minute or two, that's, you know, that won't bother you. But imagine hanging upside down with that pressure, that blood pressure add into your head for say five hours versus five minutes or five days, uh, that actually becomes quite a nuisance. And, uh, and at least for me, I had, you know, by day five, I was having really terrible, terrible headaches. It was kind of interfering with my uh, enjoyment of the, uh, of the trip, but it did start getting better right after that. Um, and then uh, on October 14th, we uh, docked with the ISS. And uh, you know, once we were on board the ISS, you know, unlike the Soyuz, which is a, a cramped but very serviceable amount of space, uh, the space station is the reverse of that. I mean, it's a, it literally is such a huge amount of space. It's you know, bigger than a 747 in the space. We were talking earlier, uh, some of us, about uh, you know, what I call the air quality, which is, I'd heard even myself that the air quality on board some of these stations may not be the best. But I'm telling you, the space station right now has enough air volume and or enough uh, air quality management systems uh, that, uh, you know, by the way, it felt vast and the air quality felt very good. Uh, but it was very interesting to juxtapose the shirt sleeve extraordinary comfort that you feel inside the space station. And when you look out the window, uh, not only the beauty of the Earth and the beauty of the station itself, but there's all kinds of small subtle cues as to why uh, just outside that window is an environment which is, while beautiful, is also extraordinarily deadly. Things like how you know the sunny side of, of objects are completely brightly, starkly lit, and the shadow side of objects are in basic complete darkness. Uh, the fact that there's no specular hazing, you know, like you get here when you look through the atmosphere on Earth, is even the farthest parts of the space station. Uh, you know, then you would think about the vacuum with the radiation and you know, temperature extremes and all these other things, and it, uh, and this weird combination of the station is, of course, lots of machined high tech parts uh, covered often with insulating you know, materials that have been hand-stitched you know, by uh, some, uh, you know, what, what appeared to be, you know, grandma's loving quilt. And so it was a, just a very, very weird combination of uh, textures and sensations you would see uh, all around the station. Um, you know, inside the station, a lot of you are probably familiar with the fact the inside is frankly quite cluttered. Uh, you know, this, if, uh, this area that I'm kind of circling here with my mouse, this is kind of my workstation. This is the window I use to shoot my pictures out of. This is my little desk, uh, my log books, uh, and uh, the stickers and patches and things from a lot of the sponsors or groups that I was working with. Um, but, you know, if I didn't point it out there, it just looks like a one amongst the clutter. Uh, <clears throat> it took me a while, actually, to adjust to the fact that a tiny little space about the size of this podium uh, would be, you know, my work environment in this giant 747. Uh, but as it turns out, it's way more than adequate since you can use, you know, all of three space and there's really no, uh, you know, difference between the, the, the wall, the ceiling, or the floor. Uh, it actually ends up being, you know, quite roomy. Although it was funny that at the time that I went up, we had a crew of six and uh, the galley was, at the time there was like one galley on the Russian side, which was really engineered for three. And so it's just really funny to see everybody use three space in order to fit six people around a three-person table. It was very common to have some of us sitting on the ceiling upside down and some of us sitting on the floor uh, in order to crowd everybody we need to around the table. And, uh, and, in my, and my, for my personal living conditions, you know, they, I, I did have a, quote, sleeping bag, which made it feel like, like you're a little more like you were at home. But again, at the time, there were three, quote, they call them cayutes, little coffin-sized bedrooms that, uh, that three uh, of the crew had. But the other three of us basically had to camp out in the hallways with our sleeping bags. And then you can see that in my case, I used bungee cords to hold it on the, the ground plane, the plane that faced the earth, uh, just because it seemed to be, in some sense, logical to me to, to feel like I was you know, lying down in that way. You know, it's funny though, I, I can still say though, if there was one thing I could redesign on the space station, it would be the toilet. And I will save this for the Q&A at the end, 
Uh, and what's funny about the space toilet is, you know, I, you know, I grew up with astronauts, so I know how stoic they are. And if you ask my dad about the toilet on either, uh, you know, the Apollo capsule he's on, or Skylab, or the shuttle, he will tell you they were all quite serviceable and they're all just fine. And if you if you press them to say which of the toilets you've ever seen in, in history the best, I'll tell you this actual Russian toilet is actually the best probably that there's been, which is why the U.S. toilet that went up just recently is basically a Russian toilet. Uh, but I'm telling you, as a as a, uh, a as a person who didn't grow up with the assumption that you would be camping out uh, wherever you go in space, uh, you know, for, for for the majority of humanity, this is still the uh, the low point, the totem pole that I can describe why I believe that later. Um, the, uh, uh, you don't need to read this slide, but this is just a, you know, the bit in my case to make that uh, you know I did not go up as a space tourist. I actually don't generally prefer, in fact, I actually go more explicitly, I don't like uh, you know uh, being referred to in that way because I do not believe what I did was tourism. And you know I've worked for 30 years to open up space. Uh, even on the other expeditions I've made around the surface of the Earth, I've done scientific research and commercial activity. And the same thing is true from, for my trip into space. And these are just some of the examples of the things that I did while in space. Some of the, a couple highlights are I mentioned this thing called protein crystal growth that I've talked about. Uh, in this case, uh, it turns out uh, that if you, uh, if you want to uh, do work to, uh, in one of the ways that you can fight diseases is to create a molecule that will bind with the protein that is involved in a disease's manifestation. The, and if you want to create a chemical to bond with that protein involved in the disease, one of the best or most useful tools is to know the exact structure of that protein molecule. One of the best ways to find structure is to grow a crystal of it, but if you grow those crystals here on the ground, convection currents disturb the growth of the crystal and you get smaller crystals and, and less good results. If you grow protein crystals in space, they're much more pure, they grow more, they grow quite a bit larger, uh, and you can often get enough resolution to see down to the position of hydrogen atoms, which is where bonding takes place. So it cuts years, uh, potentially years, and potentially tens of millions of dollars off the development of drugs. And so I think this is a very good thing to go do with your time in space, and I've, I've started a business to go do that. And I've actually flown this, I took the experiment with my, with, on my own flight, we flew it again with Guy Liberté, our most recent uh, Space Adventures client, and we're getting actually some, some very good, very promising results. Another thing I did was uh, uh, I decided to do a bunch of Earth observations because I realized I had an opportunity that would not be repeated, being the first second generation American to fly, and my father's first flight being on Skylab, which was the first time we had an orbital laboratory looking back at the Earth. And so my dad and his uh, colleagues' photographic survey of the surface of the Earth is the first such survey. And so as my father's son, I thought if I can go back and reshoot some of those same pictures, we can show how the Earth has changed in exactly one generation of space flight. And I thought that would be a, an interesting um, you know, uh, uh, way to uh, call attention to some of those changes. And so we developed uh, a piece of software called Windows on Earth where we pl plugged in all of the, uh, the previous targets. We actually added in more targets, even than the Skylab targets, the Nature Conservancy helped us uh, pick out the NASA archive targets plus some, some more contemporary ones. Uh, with that tool, I could rapidly change lenses and focal lengths and find these targets. Um, these are some examples of things you found like wildfires. Uh, and this is an example of one of the comparisons. For example, of Miami, my father's picture 35 years ago on the left and mine on the right. And uh, you know, Miami has grown by you know, about 30%, maybe 50% uh, during that period. So you can really see the urban sprawl uh, and we have lots of these uh, kind of, you know, samples of these uh, photographs of, of that time. Another thing that I really enjoyed was ham radio activities. My father actually took the very first amateur radio into space and talked to the general public from space for the first time in 1983 on uh, the Columbia uh, STS-9 flight. Um, as his son, I wanted to go back and, and also do a, a nice ham radio program all the while. He even took a slow scan television device with me and broadcast slow scan TV from space. Uh, and of course, uh, being a little more irreverent than uh, um, you know, uh, people who, who, are on the, who can't afford to be because they're being paid, uh, I did things like I broadcast pirate flags from space. And my pirate flag, that I, when I wasn't at the console and I just kind of left it kind of doing an auto slideshow, one of the slides was you know, Richard Garriott's mutiny on the ISS uh, with a pirate flag. And you know, of course, that raised a few eyebrows here on the ground. <laughs> And I did commercial work like for Seiko and DHL and my own company as well. 
I did a lot of educational outreach uh, with the Challenger Learning Centers, with the British National Space Center. Um, you know, I, I did a bunch of experiments that kids proposed and answered questions from space. And we're actually, even, even today, we're wrapping these up as a teacher's resource and distributing them to schools. Uh, Queen Mary University in London is actually doing that work right now uh, to get these all you know, come finished, edited, and, and organized. And, and back and again in the Q&A, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna ask all of you guys questions, and, and I, I know you guys think of yourselves as, as a well-educated space audience, but I'm really curious at the end, I'm gonna give by a show of hands who thinks these, uh, how, they, how you answer these questions of, you know, is it hot or cold in space? What happens if you strike a match in space? either outside on the vacuum of the space or inside at the galley table. And can you burp in space? Those are some of my favorite kid questions I'm gonna ask you guys at the end so you can be thinking about it in the meantime. I did medical research for NASA, ESA, and the Korean Space Agency, as well as Roscosmos. Uh, in homage to my mother, I uh, not only did an art show in space, I took up art, we did an art show uh, uh, while we were there, and I created art. Um, pardon the little flicker there. Um, my dad had taken a recording of my mother up on Skylab and spoofed uh, mission control. My mother was actually on board Skylab. <laughs> and, and so uh, I couldn't not reprise that, so I made my own. I made mine on a PowerPoint display. And so I could actually have an interactive conversation uh, with my mother uh, from space. And we played the, a similar joke on the Russian mission control that my dad had played on NASA mission control. I'm an amateur magician, so I did magic in space. Uh, Greg Chamatop is also a magician, so we did magic and juggling while we were up there. Uh, you know, some of you may have heard about the explosive bolt that was suspected as to being the cause of two ballistic reentries prior to my flight. Like the two previous Soyuz reentries ahead of mine, both uh, had significant problems uh, that resulted in an uncontrolled reentry, which is referred to as a ballistic reentry. Uh, and therefore also is in, in theory uh, somewhat more dangerous. And since this bolt was uh, seen as the suspect, uh, the two crewmates of mine who I came down with went out on a spacewalk and removed the bolt that was in suspicion. And so uh, that's me just modeling with this, uh, the highly threatening explosive bolt here uh, that we brought back down with us. And we didn't have malfunctions, it was very interesting. You know, I grew up at a time when we used to have what we called squawk boxes in the house, where when my dad was flying, you know, we could hear all of the up and down chatter that the Capcoms uh, would have with him in space. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting to listen to, you know, the fairly high frequency of malfunctions they had, especially on, on Skylab. Um, and it was interesting also to, to note, even on my own flight, that, you know, malfunctions are, you know, part of daily life. And they're just uh, things you deal with and, and move on. Like uh, one of the ones we had here was the condensate water processor, the thing that heats um, and pasteurizes the water which has been recycled uh, and sterilizes it, uh, shorted out and began to melt the wiring and spew smoke into the room and you know, what these really smelled like toxic gases, well I'm sure they weren't, uh, and also steam, hot steam began to spray out into the room. Uh, so you know, it uh, seems like a, you know, potentially an emergency, but you just walk over and you shut off the breaker, take the thing offline, pull out the screwdrivers, unmount it, and miraculously, there had been a spare one of these on board for like the last 10 years, and uh, so they just plugged the spare in and off we went with the new one. And it's, but sadly, of course, after, after 12 days of space, it's time to go. Uh, you know, one of the things I thought was very interesting about undocking is you'll notice that here we are just undocked and backing away from the space station, and you notice you can see the horizon of the Earth. And what's important about that is that the, the, the Soyuz docks underneath the space station. So you would think that if you undocked, you should go back towards the Earth, and the, this picture should be aiming up into space. What's interesting, though, is that when you undock, if your engines fail to work, as you go around the Earth, due to orbital mechanics, you would switch positions 45 minutes later on the other side of the Earth, which means you're going to crash back into the space station. So to prevent that, they actually rotate the entire space station 90 degrees before you undock. So you, uh, you undock from behind the space station. And what's interesting about that is that I, that I really wasn't aware that was going to happen until quite late in the training. And I'm going, now, wait a minute, they have all these microgravity experiments on board that every time you duck, you're actually gimbling the entire space station 90 degrees. And we're like, I sure hope the people who involved these experiments are, are prepared for that, because at least I wasn't uh, expecting this to occur in, 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 you know, in, until quite late. Um, we then did undock. As many of you might know, uh, the uh, orbital module includes, the, the, your, your, the Soyuz uh, orbital vehicle includes three parts. Only this middle section here uh, is the descent module. There's a hatch up here at the top, and the heat shield is down here at the bottom. 
everything else is going to be ejected just prior to, to re-entry. Um, when you did interface with the Earth's atmosphere, I was really surprised how quickly you go from being in the blackness of space to being in the plasma uh, that is created by uh, touching the upper atmosphere going you know, 17,000 miles an hour. You know, you're ripping air, you know, molecules apart, creating this plasma that's you know, hotter than the surface of the sun, which is you know, four inches away from my right shoulder. And, uh, and while on the inside, it's actually completely comfortable. I mean, it, it doesn't get hot on the inside at all. Uh, you know, you don't, at the time this plasma begins, you don't really feel any force. There's definitely no sound. Uh, but it's just uh, intellectually striking uh, that, you know, you're, you're here in a blast furnace that, uh, you know, is basically the, the temperature of the surface of the sun. Uh, we did have some malfunctions. We, uh, you know, I, I, uh, once the parachutes deployed, I did have this uh, bottle to, uh, come loose from the uh, packing restraints and wedge between my helmet and that window. It actually crushed my helmet onto my face, so I couldn't turn my head inside my helmet, and I was a little worried that it might break the seal of my helmet. Um, once uh, the air pressure uh, equalization valve was opened, we had what's often referred to as smoke come into the cabin. Uh, it actually, I believe, is condensation based on there's a, a icy uh, O2 flow uh, pipe there that I think is causing condensation. <coughs> but uh, we never did really find out what that was from. And then, uh, as some of you might know, that as opposed to landing on a runway like a shuttle or landing in the ocean like Apollo, uh, the Russians land on land. And so when you land in a six-ton vehicle on the physical Earth, i got to tell you, that is an amazing wallop when you hit the ground. And, uh, and it doesn't just hit the ground. It hits the ground and then bounces and rolls for you know, 10 or 15 seconds. And so you're in a six-ton bouncing boulder on the surface of the Earth. It is a... Uh, you know, noteworthy. Uh, but again, you're in a perfectly form-fitted seat. You saw at the very beginning of this journey that they were casting. Uh, the seat itself has shock absorbers as well to take some of that uh, initial impact, and you're strapped into this big five-point harness. So it's actually quite comfortable. Uh, but uh, you know, they they do to make sure that uh, you know about 10 seconds prior to impact, everybody quits talking and you close your mouth to make sure you don't bite your tongue off uh, because of the, the strength of that impact. Meters from the predicted target. So literally, they were driving vehicles around underneath us, waiting for the waiting for us to hit the ground. Before the parachutes even completely furled, they were already tapping on the window and rolling it over to the attitude to be able to start cranking it over. I mean, it was instantaneous uh, that they were there for recovery, which is a real advantage from a, a, a crew safety standpoint. Uh, you know, and I mentioned, you know, you, you know, my father was there at the beginning. I, I neglected to mention that he was my chief scientist for my whole mission. He helped me plan it. He was there at the base of the rocket as I boarded it. He ran my mission control team throughout my flight, and he was on the rescue helicopters to come pick me up. So it was actually a great uh, chance for the two of us to uh, uh, do something very special together as well for that year. Okay, so that's the arc of my trip. But one of the things that, you know, probably my biggest takeaway from the trip was, was how surprised I was about how fundamentally life-changing seeing the Earth from space is. And I really believe in the uh, you know, profound importance of getting some significant percentage of the population to get a chance to go do this. And, and if, you haven't, if you're not already convinced that you personally need to go do this, I'd like to convince you that you personally need to go do this. And, uh, and, and, and then after I describe why and publicly convince you, I'm going to tell you how I think, it's all gonna, how, how I think we're all going to get a chance to go. I hope you guys still can go and hopefully I'll get a chance to go again. You know, I already mentioned to you that when I first saw the Earth from space, you know, my first thought was, wow, I hope we're in a perfectly circular orbit. You know, one of, the, one of the second things that struck me was just how astoundingly thin the, the Earth's atmosphere is. And this picture illustrates that pretty well, I think, where you can see that if you look at the altitude of the clouds above the surface of the Earth, you know, it's only 10 or 20 times higher than that before the atmosphere is so, so thin it will no longer refract light, and basically you're in space. And uh, and it really just isn't that high compared to just going outside and looking up at the clouds. I mean, it's really just stunning how close uh, you know, airliners fly to the true limits of the, of the effective atmosphere. Another thing I found that was really just very striking was when you look straight down out of a window of the United Space Station, how familiar the, the view looks. For example, you, know, you see airplane contrails and clouds and things that, again, don't look that dissimilar from looking out the window of an airplane. You're, you know, you're 10 or 20 times higher, so you see a lot more of it. You're traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, so it's going by really fast. But a snapshot of it actually looks pretty familiar. 
In fact, when you look down at places that you know well, like this is San Francisco, and this is zoomed in. This isn't quite the same view you get from, from you know, by eye, so to speak. But you can see here's the Golden Gate Bridge. Here's Alcatraz. Here's the Oakland Bay Bridge. You know, here's a ship and its weight coming in and out, in and out of the bay. I mean, these are all things that, you know, you can even see, you know, Golden Gate Park in pretty good detail and a lot of the main highways you can see. And you can see those by eye from space. You know, it was also interesting to note that one of the things you really truly can't see from space are things like the Great Wall of China, which at least in my era, everybody was taught to use one of the few man-made things you could see from space, which, like I said, you can't. Um, but um, I was really stunned at how, how familiar the view was. But again, when you, instead of looking down, if you look out, <coughs> You see the you know the grand you know, scale of the Earth, and what I thought was interesting is when I saw Houston, Austin, Dallas, and the Gulf Coast, things that I've driven many many times, as you guys have, I'm sure. Uh, so I know those scales intimately. When I saw that and the entire Earth, you go, I now know by direct observation the true scale of the Earth. And even though everybody kind of goes, yeah, you can look see that in the globe as well. But I mean, I'm telling you, it just kind of strikes you. It, it feels meaningful when you go, oh, I kind of get it. I see the true scale of the Earth. I see the true, stunningly finite, if not very small, amount of air that we have on the surface of this Earth. Uh, those begin to, you know, you, you begin to absorb these. Uh, you know, you you learn a lot about meteorology. You know, about half the Earth is always covered in clouds. And so, for example. Uh, you know, as you go around the Earth every you know, 90 minutes, you see a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. And it was only out of the Pacific I would see things like this. So this is a really wide-angle lens. This is thousands of miles across. This is a giant laminar front that could only grow in the Pacific where there's no land masses or other interference to cause, you know, or interference with its ability to become such a massive, smooth front. On the other hand, you go out of the Atlantic, it's always a lot more chaotic. And in this case, I got really lucky and got to catch a hurricane. You know, when you begin to see the physical surface of the Earth, at first a lot of what you see is deserts, because deserts are not covered in clouds, generally speaking, because they're deserts. And when you look down at deserts, you begin to see a lot of what we'll call the, broadly, the geomorphology of the Earth. For example, you can see the results of all the eons of tech, uh, tectonic plate movement. You really get a sense for how the, you know, Earth, the, the, these large-scale systems work on the Earth. The amount of water erosion you know, around the coast of every continent on Earth there's not only just an enormous number of rivers reaching the coast, but you can see all the silt that they're washing off the, you know, the off the surface and into the oceans. You get a sense of the scale of erosion that is constantly happening day in and day out all over the surface of the earth. Even wind erosion was something I was very impressed by. I mean, I, I had these targets in my photo list called great fans. I had never, nobody ever told me what a great fan was. It just came up on my target list. And I looked out the window, saw this, and had to get again a super wide angle lens to see this. This is thousands of square miles across. This is formations out in some of these deserts that where the wind has been flowing in one direction for probably thousands of years, they were required to deeply etch the surface of the earth in this way that is visible only really from space. If you were, if you were actually walking around on that, uh, you know, the, none of that formation would be evident to you at all. It's only perceivable uh, from something as far away as space. Of course, I worked hard to get a picture of my own house. Uh, so that's, uh, there we are in Austin. But, but part and parcel of that was is that every fertile part of the Earth that I saw, and this is only something I figured out after being in space for a couple of weeks, every fertile part of the Earth you can see from space is fully occupied by people. Everywhere on the surface of the Earth that is green is either a city or a farm, with very few exceptions. And in fact, even if you, once you began to notice this, you would then look at the places that humanity wasn't obvious, like, for example, it's pretty hard to build a big city in, up in the snowy you know, peaks. But if you look in the valleys in the snowy, between the snowy peaks, there's roads and dams and farms and things like that, too. If you look at the deserts, we're terraforming the deserts. You know, I just happened to glance out the window one day and saw the palm, palm islands there in Dubai. But this was another really common sight, was to see all, even in those giant deserts, there's highways crisscrossing them. The ancient riverbeds where there's underground water, the water being pumped up, where they're growing these giant industrial farms. And there's no city anywhere near this, by the way. Even at the horizon of the Earth, from 250 miles up, there was no city to see. So this food is being grown out in the desert and then trucked thousands of miles to some population center that I never could figure out where it was. And this can't be nearly as what I call cheap or inexpensive or cost-effective as growing in the fertile parts of the Earth, if you know what I mean. It just is, it, it began to, you're building up this image of just how hard we're working to 
dig and find resources to, find, to get the basic sustenance we need from the surface of the earth. Another thing I was really struck by was all these fires that I saw across the Amazon. I remember my father telling me stories, one of the stories he had told often actually after Skylab was how all the time that we go to the Amazon basin, <coughs> through the middle fertile belts, there were constantly these fires. And I've done dug out canoeing down the Amazon myself and seen them from ground level and seen how they're clear cutting. But I was stunned to then go from space and you know look out the window and sure enough, it's still going on. So you know, for at least 35 years and probably much, much longer, uh, you know, we've basically been clear cutting and burning in the Amazon. And even the Amazon, by the way, the only parts of the Amazon that are not built out are places that are really swampy. So either it's, if it's really deserty or really covered with ice or really swampy, okay, humanity's not really fully exploited that area. But any place that's relatively dry and green, we are, we are everywhere. Uh, the same thing is true, by the way, in the fertile bends across Africa. I know it's on these slides, it might, those might look like clouds by eye, you can, you know, uh, before it was photographed, you can really differentiate the colors of the smoke and the clouds much better. Uh, but again, the whole fertile band across Africa, again, lots and lots and lots and lots of fires burning all the way across the middle of Africa. In South American Africa, the whole continent was basically covered in, in, in brown, orange, uh, smoggy smoke. Uh, you know, and that, makes you, that inspired me to come back to the Earth, you know, when I came back, to go do some research. You, go, you know, we've had satellites up now for about the same period. Satellites, you know, that was my kind of, my, uh, uh, my aesthetic judgment, but what is the, my subjective opinion? What's the objective uh, data come from satellites? And, and the satellite data basically says the same thing, which is that humanity is getting close to you know, basically exploiting at about one for one on a global basis, the, what are called the natural productivity of the Earth. And not that we can't desalinate more water and grow more crops as we use up all the fresh water, but that just means it's gonna cost even more. And so I just look at this, and it, it, for, at least for me, it directs me back to energy issues, because like, wow, you know, we're gonna need, uh, you know, you know, we're going to need a lot more energy if we want to continue to grow these economies and, uh, and continue to get to, you know, plentiful fresh water, et cetera. And so it really made me, you know, much more, you know, what you might call an environmentalist. But now I'm going to, we're on to the, what I call the third and final you know, phase of, of subject I'd like to talk to you about, which is the way that I believe that uh, the access to space is now changing. I mean, First of all, you know, I feel very fortunate and lucky to have been what I would call part of what has instigated this change. Uh, but of course, at first that instigation was frankly quite selfish, which, so I could figure out how to get myself into space. Um, and of course, I'm not, I'm not even trying to claim to be a big uh, one of the players, but at least was a participant in this process of the privatization of space. But what's, what's interesting is that it's really uh, you know, it, it took us a decade or two to really get it moving, but now it is moving very, very quickly uh, with, with, I think, very profound impacts about what the next couple of decades of, of space travel are going to be like. For example, even today, you know, space access is quite expensive, it's relatively dangerous, and you put those two things together and that generally means it's going to be pretty uncommon. You know, I'm the 483rd person to have orbited the Earth in 50 years. And that's still a pretty small number, but with those criteria, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's understandable why that, would be, why that would be the case. But what's interesting about that, though, is when you start going back 50 years ago, there really was, you know, there, there was nothing known about how to do this 50 years ago. That those very first 10 years saw a stunning list of advancements. You know, we saw Sputnik, the first object to go off, off uh, around the Earth at all. Gagarin, the first human to, to orbit the Earth. Uh, Alexei Leonov, who's actually a good friend of mine now, uh, and the first guy to actually go out on a spacewalk. In fact, the Russians had a whole myriad of firsts in there that uh, I don't even give them nearly the credit they deserve for on an uh, international basis. And of course, uh, the moon landings that, that we did. And but again, those all came within the you know, first ten or fifteen years. And uh, and since then, of course, we as we're all intimately familiar, we have not gone back to the moon. We have built an amazingly wonderful International Space Station. It's a, a stunning achievement, and it is a stunning asset to the United States and the global, global uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, group that, that has the ISS partners. Um, but it's still expensive, dangerous, and rare. And what I think is important about that is, you know, a lot of us who grew up in the Apollo era, we all believed in the Stanley Kubrick's 2001 vision of the near-term future right up until 2001. And then we realized that you know, not only have we not made it, 
but we're not anywhere near making it there. And I think most of us, if we're trying to, if we're going to actually evaluate when, we're, when are we going to have that kind of space station with artificial gravity due to its rotation and the scale of this, you know, that's a long way off. You know, that may be hundreds of years off before we actually achieve that. And for a lot of us who grew up believing this was the future, um, we're understandably disappointed. Uh, but what's interesting, and, and there's a documentary out called Orphans of Apollo, so I haven't kind of adopted that term for all of us who you know, were inspired by Apollo to get into science, technology, engineering, and math, which is one of the great things that came out of and still can and often comes out of uh, the space experience. Um, but, uh, but what happened is that uh, many of us, including myself, not only felt the disappointment, but we were inspired, and we were inspired to go into, to, to go build a lot of the technology companies that have just in the last 20 years been responsible for the technology revolution we've just been through. And what's interesting to see is that uh, additionally a lot of those orphans of Apollo have started kind of this little hidden agenda of infiltrating uh, corporate space corporations and the national government, uh, you know, from the space policy standpoint. And what I mean by that is like you, uh, you know, Peter Diamandis was one of the co-founders of uh, SEDS, the Students for the Exploration Development of Space. If you look at the heads of most space corporations these days, there's generally a lot of SEDS members in it. If you look at NASA, uh, the DC office, a lot of SEDS members in it. International Space University, an outgrowth of that, also those graduates are in those same high positions. Look at XPRIZE, Zero G, Space Adventures. These, uh, they're also not only populated by graduates of those areas, but they're part of this what I call entrepreneurial business. But what's interesting is see how much deeper it goes. For example, Elon Musk, I think, would, uh, would, would describe himself as an orphan of Apollo. He was definitely inspired by that era to get into science, technology, science and technology. You probably, many of you here probably know his company. He was, he was also the founder of PayPal. He also started Tesla Motor Cars, a, a great uh, fully electric sports car company. And he started SpaceX. And so he has, as so many of us have done, we went and started high tech companies, achieved some wealth or uh, you know, success in high tech, and now returning to space. Um, and so with his company SpaceX, for example, he's already put a couple satellites in orbit. He has a contract to be taking cargo to the ISS here soon. And it's possible that in the not terribly distant future, he'll get some, uh, get some work taking crew to the ISS. You know, one of my contemporaries in the games industry, John Carmack, he has a company called id Software from Dallas. He's the author of the Doom and Quake series of games, these first-person shooter games that are incredibly popular. He now is circled back and he's making rockets. He's got a company called Armadillo Aerospace. They're winning a bunch of prizes and challenges as they build a vehicle that will be able to reach, uh, uh, right now they're doing lunar lander samples and they're right on the verge of getting, going suborbital. <coughs> Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com. He circled back and making rockets now too. He's got a company called Blue Origin. They're a little bit more secretive than uh, some of the other guys, so we don't know exactly what their status is, but they've already won uh, or winning some NASA contracts to do some, some work as well. There's a guy named Robert Bigelow. He's a Las Vegas hotel mogul. Uh, he already has put two inflatable station module samples into space uh, in orbit, uh, and he plans to put up uh, you know, both uh, uh, government uh, research laboratories private orbital laboratories and hotels, private hotels in space. And, uh, and he's, got, you know, he's well funded from, with his personal assets and is, is making good progress. And you're probably familiar with uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, which is built on the back of uh, the XPRIZE, uh, where uh, you know, he took the vehicles that were developed through the XPRIZE, or one of the vehicles, uh, the, the vehicle that won the XPRIZE, Spaceship One, and he's, he's uh, put uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into the development of Spaceship Two, and a few years ago, they'll be able to take passengers suborbitally. You know, we've got companies uh, like this one, uh, Jeff Greeson's company, Export Aerospace, which uh, you know plans to make a uh, you know, basically a, a single uh, stage to space space plane uh, that uh, you know they're making pretty good progress on. <coughs> you know, and you've got people like myself who uh, you know again I came from the high tech industry of uh, make computer games. And I have circled back and helped fund the X Prize and, and the, uh, you know, the chairman of the board and the first big financier of the Space Adventures. And even when you talk about this commercial side, the NASA Prime Contract, as a number of you guys are in here, you know, uh, here today too, uh, you know, I think that everybody kind of gets it. Everybody kind of gets that, you know, just like the satellite business, where you know uh, everybody from NASA to the Department of Defense to commercial satellite launchers 
go out and buy satellite launch services from a wide variety of, of makers, that same thing is ultimately the way it surely will eventually end up uh, with human space flight. Uh, and it appears that it's sooner than later. Uh, and so a lot of the, what you might call traditional NASA prime contractors are now also putting in bids to do a lot of these same quote commercial, whatever that term really means, because I think the NASA prime contractors already are commercial. Um, but, uh, but, but I really think this is fundamentally a new procurement method where you're buying a launch service versus parts and pieces that, that NASA might assemble uh, themselves the way they do currently now with the orbiter. And, and so this, the pace of development for what I'll broadly still call commercial space flight or, or uh, entrepreneurial space or private space, uh, there's a lot of terms I think that have yet to settle out. Uh, but you know, in my mind, what's interesting is the heavy lifting has already really been done. You know, not only did NASA do the, the big, you know, what I'll call profound uh, changes, even in those very first 10 years, the profound accomplishments in those first 10 years, but in the intervening 30 or 40 years since then, all of the materials and techniques have not only been published or in the public domain, but all of the materials, like all the special alloys of aluminum that were developed to hold cryogenic fuels, are now used all over the place. All of the, uh, the pumps and valves and things that were used to, to handle all those things like cryogenic fuels are now used in air conditioning you know, supply places. I mean, all the, 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 what the, the, the space industry has been incredibly successful about taking those advancements and putting them now into general use in a wide variety of other means uh, throughout America. And what that means is that in a, in a sense, rocket science is no longer rocket science. And here's what I mean by that. Let's look at this Armadillo aerospace rocket. Armadillo has invented a couple of really great new things. One is their nozzle. The rocket nozzle that they have on the bottom of this vehicle, they've spent you know, almost a decade engineering over and over and over again until they have created what uh, they would refer to as a non-oblative um, rocket nozzle. So it can be fired over and over and over and over again uh, without uh, wearing out. And that's taken them some time to figure out. Another thing that John Carmack is particularly good at as an individual is computer control and is the navigation of his vehicle. That's, and he's just a great engineer on that front. And so their, their, their vehicle uh, has really an outstanding command and control regime. He also had to, make, he had to make a couple of what are called special purchases, or one in particular. Those fuel tanks, those two big spheres, are made out of, again, one of these very special types of aluminum alloys. It had to be turned on a giant lathe, had to be welded together. They had to test it very carefully to make sure it could handle the temperatures and pressures. So that was a very special piece of construction. But that's it. That's where the specialist ends. Every other part of that rocket you can buy on the internet, and generally speaking, that's what they did. They literally you bought a regular computer, you can put a GPS card in it, an accelerometer card in it, there's great long distance high quality communications hardware you can drop in it, uh, all the control valves, uh, all the pumps, everything else, literally the aluminum tubing is welded up in the shop, everything else, any high school or college team that competes in say first robotics with a fairly small number of thousands of dollars of support can now create rockets that will fly to space. And they are, like another company, like there's a, on, on these XPRIZE uh, Lunar Challenges, Lunar Lander Challengers, there's a father-son team that literally created one that just won the level one, uh, you know, became, I think, third in the level one challenge. Uh, and they did their garage, literally, father-son in their garage, team of two in the garage, are making vehicles which are mighty close to being able to get up into space. And, and so it, the, the world has truly changed quietly over the last 20 years, and people just didn't know it until after the XPRIZE. But then, just over a month ago, something, you know, what I'll call the, the, mo the most profound thing in, in recent history for spaceflight ha has changed. And that was the announcement uh, by President Obama and NASA Administrator Bolden uh, to say that they want to you know, change the focus of NASA. I know it's affected a lot of people here in this room adversely, um, but uh, you know, the current, the proposed plan is to cancel Constellation uh, cancel the, the general funding and strategy of, uh, of that plan to not only take us to low Earth orbit, but even more, more importantly, uh, at least in my mind, you know, beyond Earth orbit and to the moon and potentially on the Mars, etc. And and so I think that you know, I think all of us who are interested in space at first are going like, wow, that is you know profoundly disappointing. And uh, and I think that in the best of all worlds. 
you know, we absolutely should continue to, uh, to do that. However, it is true that that is, you know, if, if you're going to continue to do that, it is, you, you can measure, you can predict what that cost is, and if we decide we cannot afford that, well, then, you know, so be it. And what I find interesting about that, and of course, you, know, you guys are probably intimately familiar with what the cancellation, this cancellation would mean. It would, it would cancel the Ares uh, 1 and 5, the heavy lift and crew lift capability, cancel Orion, uh, the Altair lander, uh, all the things necessary to go to the to moon or other bodies and back. But what's interesting about the, the strategy, you know, if, if you accept that, okay, we can't afford to, to, to do that, or we're not going to choose to afford to do that, Another thing that I had been disappointed in, in the last 20 years, when we spent 100% of our money, or close to 100%, on the construction and maintenance of the space station, and pretty darn close to 0% of the money on doing any science on the space station, and I'm looking at this space station, having been there, I'm going, it is a glorious scientific laboratory. The, the quality of the equipment that we have on board that space station is phenomenal. But without you know, significant funding, that will have been a waste. And so one of the things I think is a great benefit or something we need to capture regardless is we've got to figure out how to get enough money to do science on board that space station. And if that's one of the collateral benefits of that, of that sacrifice, it's a pretty darn good collateral benefit in my mind. More importantly, or equally importantly, is the addition of $6 billion to invest in this quote commercial or private or entrepreneurial uh, space activity. And I, again, I know I'm, again, I, I'm somewhat biased in the sense of I have, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've made investments over time to engender uh, the existence of this, of this uh, or help bring into existence this commercial or private side. Uh, but I actually just still sincerely believe it is ultimately the right thing to do. And by having the government as a anchor tenant, just like the government did with airmail for airlines, you can take something that I think will ultimately happen regardless, but really accelerate it dramatically if, if these private companies know that NASA will be a, uh, uh, an anchor user. And here's how, this is how, I think the, the economics of space, I believe in the next 10 years, are going to change profoundly. And here is my case I'll make for that. I mean, if you look at the space station, and again, it's a phenomenal uh, asset, but we have spent 20 years, about $100 billion building it. We spend $2 billion a year just to keep it in orbit and not splash it. And we spend somewhere on the order of $300 million, as a personal guesstimate, I don't actually know what the real figure is, per astronaut to put people up uh, you know, on board the space station. You know, if you think about that and go, hey, I've got an idea for an experiment that I want to go do on one of those racks. If you have to pay your fair share of that cost, which by the way, in full cost accounting, which says everything is done nowadays, you do try to count those costs. And by the way, that is such a huge barrier to get over. It's actually, no matter what you do, it's going to be very difficult to justify any experiments because of how expensive it was to build it and how expensive it is to get there to utilize it. So to even make use of this thing we've already built, we really need to change fundamentally the economics of access to space. And I believe that in the next 10 years, the cost will come down by a factor of 10 or potentially even 100. And here's my, here's my case studies for that. You know, if you think about uh, fully reusable uh, transport that we, that we use every day, like cars, boats, planes, and trains, the cost to own and operate a car, a boat, or a plane, or a train, where literally all you have to do, you're driving around yourself, you don't need 5,000 people on the as a ground team to operate it, uh, you're not going to throw it away after you use it, uh, you're not going to like drive your car to the gas station and when you refill it, crush it and go buy a new one. Uh, you know, you, these vehicles that you literally just drive up and refill and reuse, generally cost about three times the fuel energy cost to operate. <clears throat> and right now, if you look at space, it's way beyond 100 times the fuel to operate because you're crushing the car every time you refuel it, effectively. And so, you know, we were having a discussion earlier about, you know, the need for propulsion beyond chemical rockets, and I personally don't think we need it. I personally think a much easier and important place to tackle is that multiplier on that energy cost. That if we can truly get to things that you can casually drive like a car to space, or a plane to space, land and refuel and take off again, or as close to that as you can get, you can radically reduce the cost of access to space. <coughs> and, and I'll describe how things can occur, but let me describe what I think happens if you pull this off. You know, I paid tens of millions to go to space, but I started businesses in space that I know are worth millions of dollars. 
uh, tens of millions, but millions. But it, it's pretty easy for me to at least extrapolate as one entrepreneur, at least one data point as to where something very interesting will happen. If the price of access to space dropped by a factor of 10, I would have made very good profit on my own trip to space. And as soon as people can make a profit by flying themselves into space, how many of you are gonna to choose to go into space? Everyone. Every entrepreneur with a good idea to go into space is absolutely gonna pursue it if they believe, and it often occurs, that they actually make money through the exercise. And so if we can drop the price of access to space by 10 to 100, I actually believe there will be a absolute gold rush of activity but it demands this reduction in price. Because right now the price is so high, it's very difficult to envision entrepreneurial activity in space. But with only a 10 times reduction, it becomes much more probable. One of those I talked about earlier is this protein crystal growth. I think that's worth millions and millions of dollars. Uh, there's another company, and uh, they were in Houston, they just moved to Austin. It's actually what grew out of Space Lab. They now call themselves AstroTech. They're putting uh, getaway specials on the shuttle uh, lockers at the moment, but they're gonna probably need to figure something else out here soon. They're doing vaccine development, and they're making a run of it even at the current prices, but boy, are they excited about the possibility of getting cheaper access to space. <coughs> and so here is, here is one of the things, here's what I think is gonna happen in the next few years. So here's my personal vision of the future of space uh, and how it unfolds. One is, in the next three to five years, you're gonna see what I consider the brainstorm, barnstorming era of suborbital activity. Not only will Virgin be going, but I believe uh, Armadillo and a number of others are going to get to space. This is one of the visions of the Armadillo uh, vehicle. You notice those ganged up two tank stacks? That's really just six of their two tank things that you already saw. Uh, and then you put a little bubble on top and let a couple people ride up on it. It's a, basically a vertical elevator. It goes straight up to 100 kilometers and lands under power vertically uh, right at the same place it took off. Uh, this will be an incredibly cost-effective way to go to space. Everyone on Earth who wants to go to space, who can afford to buy a first-class ticket around the Earth, you know, if you go to Australia back, let's say, can afford to go to space. And that pretty much means anybody who really wants to. So I really believe in just a few years, anyone will get a chance to at least see the Earth from space. You know, we, we, we talk, everybody knows about uh, SpaceX with the Dragon. You know, they're already going to be taking cargo and, uh, you know, perhaps crew after that. So we're again talking, you know, three to five years before we begin to see that come online. Another one that I'm particularly excited about that a few of us were talking about earlier um, is a company called Reaction Engines out of the UK. This is a group that's actually sponsored by the UK government. It's a vehicle called Skylon. It is a single stage to orbit to dock with the International Space Station space plane. So no stages get dropped. And this has been a holy grail that people have talked about for many years, but most people think is impossible, or it has been impossible, it probably hasn't literally been impossible. But these guys believe they can pull it off. I've been to their shop, I've, I've heard them make their pitch. They're actually making very good progress. It's a vehicle that breathes air at low altitudes, takes off like an airplane at a runway, and once it gets to a certain altitude, you know, shuts the front of those engines and starts pumping in liquid oxygen uh, and rockets on up to orbit. And, uh, and then lands by, uh, uh, with a non-ablative heat shield by pumping, again, some of those really cold refrigerants just under the skin uh, of the, the leading edge uh, to make sure that it uh, stays cool all the way to the ground. And even though, you know, when I first heard about this, I was thinking like, you know, if you're, if you reach for something that's far-fetched, so to speak, or far beyond what people can, can do currently, you know, if you, if you make it, you're brilliant, and if you fail, you're a crackpot. And, uh, and, and my initial impression of these guys was, wow, they're reaching pretty far, I think, you know, there's a high risk these guys are gonna eventually be seen as crackpots. But having now been out to their, their site and seen uh, the way they're engineering this and how far they've made it, these guys are actually pretty darn far along on the fundamentals of being able to pull this off. And so uh, they very, very well might. And by the way, if they pull this off, this will, in itself will drop the price of mass, uh, any mass or people to orbit by ten, at least 10, closer to 100, if this succeeds. You know, Bigelow, who's already got a couple of the smaller modules in orbit, you know, this is an example of what his, uh, you know, uh, you know, private space stations, you know, might look like. You know, and when you talk about going back to the moon, and you, you might think, well, okay, maybe private industry can handle, handle low Earth orbit. I actually think private industry can even handle, or at least help significantly with even the moon. You know, we have the Google Lunar X Prize already underway, which is a $25 million prize for an unmanned lunar rover to rove on the moon. But, you know, here literally in just a half a dozen years or so, I would fully expect to have 
um, you know, at least one, if not multiple, private rovers built again by, generally speaking, what I call universities and, and relatively small, relatively modestly funded organizations, will be able to rove on the moon. And that's a pretty darn good step, just like the X Prize was to put a human in space at all, was a really important door opener to now this big wave of private companies that coming in behind it. I believe the Google Lunar X Prize could represent the same thing for being able to put, uh, you know, Habitats down the, on the moon, or oxygen generators, or you know, uh, uh, incubators of one kind or another on the moon. So I, I think that uh, private industry can even help on all the way to the moon. And you know, and, and this might be a, a little bit reaching now, but I mean, but you know, one of the things I'm just so compelled about a, a lunar base is that uh, you know, it's, it's visionary things like how that in one sixth gravity, but at one pressure atmosphere, you know, you can fly under your own power just with the strength in your arms. You can flap wings with enough propulsion to actually fly, and all all the different kinds of you know new ways to live, work, and play on the moon you know will ultimately exist. <clears throat> and then when you go beyond that out to Mars, you know Mars is yet again considerably harder. You know if I and if I had to say you know what do I think you know what would I, what would I vote for NASA's mission to be? You know I would say well if, of course if it could be the moon that'd be great, but private industry might be able to help backfill that in the current reality. Uh, and if you know and if, if uh, NASA, with their new focus on science and technology, can be thinking of even bolder steps you know, that we've truly never been to before. Uh, you know, I think uh, that that is an era, area where uh, you know, private, private industry might be able to be a little bit of a backup, but really there's just no way that humanity can tackle these kinds of challenges unless it's under you know, what I call a government-sponsored mission. And you know, I'm also a believer, as is uh, Stephen Hawking, that, you know, that humanity must not just travel into space, but really homestead in space. You know, I don't know if you guys uh, know that, uh, I'm not sure you all know who Stephen Hawking is, uh, but a few years ago we actually took him up on a zero-G flight on our zero-G plane. Uh, he also hopes to travel into space uh, with one of these suborbital vehicles. Uh, you know, he's still in pretty good health and uh, the timeline's pretty short to get these uh, vehicles done, so I think there's reasonable odds he will become a space traveler. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and I, I tend to believe like he does, which is that if humanity wants to continue to exist perpetually, we have to become multi-planet because it's only you know, a matter of time uh, before you know humanity on any one planet is under threat of extinction, and uh, you, know, you can debate whether that's billions of years off or what the probability is that it might be sooner. But there's definitely, you know, even even on relatively soon time frames, there is a finite but real possibility. And so, you know, in my mind, no time like the present to uh, start getting ourselves in the gear. And uh, you know, and that's why you know I really think that you know for those of us who are space enthusiasts, you know, the time to you know, talk about could we, wouldn't we, shouldn't we all travel to space? You know, that that time has passed. The door is now open. It is now possible. It's been, it's been proven. The X Prize proved it. Elon has proved it. Uh, you know, you don't have to have government backing to make it into space. With government support, we can make it there all the much, all that much more, uh, all the much more quickly. But I really think you know the, the time to talk about going to space is over. The time to take action is now. And now is the time, and if you're already employed in the space industry, to uh, especially if there's any you know, youngsters who are still thinking about uh, you know, uh, school or college in the room, uh, you know, now is the time to start saying, you know, what role do you want to play? Do you want to go to space? Do you want to build rockets to go to space? Uh, you know, whereas it used to be a pipe dream for anybody, a very low probability get a, a, a trial for anybody, I really think now that anyone who is property minded can chart a course for how they can participate in it, it, if not only in the creation of vehicles, but in their own uh, journey with the stars. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, 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 how am I way over or where are we on time? I actually didn't uh, know we're, we're just about perfect on time. Great. <laughs> so uh, in that case, I, I, uh, if you guys have some questions, or oh, in fact, I'll, I'll start off with some questions for you. This again should, uh, you know, don't no fair looking at your uh, friends who are employed in the business who ought to know. But even those who ought to know, I'm just curious. Uh, I want to see you raise your hands, please. How many people think that uh, it is hot in space? Raise your hands. How many people? Almost no one. How many people think it's cold in space? Raise your hands. A bit more. And how many people think it's a trick question and it depends on where you are and in other circumstances? Okay, most everybody. So you guys are ready. You guys know this a little better than most. Um, and as most of you probably actually know, of course, temperature is a measure of the velocity of a molecule. And so, you know, to the degree that space is a vacuum, 
Uh, of course, it's a perfect insulator and really has no temperature. But most people ask that question, when kids ask that question, they're really asking, will I feel hot or will I feel cold? And of course, if you're in the sun, you'll thermally load up and get very hot. And in fact, in Soyuz, when you go through all the ways that you might die in the Soyuz, like running out of air or whatever else, uh, it turns out that if everything else is operating nominally, but you can't re-enter and you get stuck in orbit, the way you're going to die is you're going to cook. And so uh, we went through that scenario in some detail. Um, but of course, as you also know, that if you're on the shadowy side of the Earth, or if you're on a spacewalk on the shadow side of the space station, uh, with infrared radiation, you slowly radiate your heat wave, and you, you'll actually get quite chilly. Um, so, uh, uh, so that is an interesting trick question. So I guess a similar one about uh, lighting matches in space. Another of my favorite questions was kids asked, you know, if I'm out on a, a spacewalk, and I strike, you know, take a wooden safety match, and I strike it outside of my spacesuit in the vacuum of space, will it light? How many people think the match will ignite? Almost no one. How many think the match will not ignite? Almost everyone. Uh, I actually believe the correct answer is, is that the match will ignite because there are three things required for fire. Fuel, oxidizer, and heat. The tip of a wooden safety match has fuel and oxidizer built into it and the friction strikes the match, I mean heats the match. But once the tip has burned, you run out of oxidizer and of course in the vacuum space it will go out. So now let's talk about the, the other, uh, and by the way, so there's a question I think everybody in this room should have known, and unless you're going to argue with me about whether the vacuum space would prevent the oxidizer from actually working in the tip of the match, which me and my dad have had this argument a few times, but if you weren't making that part of the argument, uh, you know, hopefully you would at least agree that it's reasonably probable the match will light. Um, now let's suppose you're at the galley and you want to strike a candle. You set a candle in the middle of the galley table. If you want to have a romantic candle at dinner for some reason, you strike that same or another safety, wooden safety match, intending to light the candle. When I strike that match, will it ignite? How many people think that match will ignite inside the space station? How many people think the match will not ignite? How many people think it will do the exact same thing it would do in the vacuum of space, but for a slightly different reason? A couple of us. So again, this is an experiment they wouldn't actually have to perform in space. Uh, but, uh, but I believe the correct answer to this is that the tip of the match will burn for the same reasons it would burn in the vacuum of space, because there's the fuel, the oxidizer, and the heat. But once you're down to just the wood, even though there is oxygen in the, in the environment around you, without forced air ventilation or convection currents due to gravity, the, where when you strike a match or a candle here, the heat rises and takes the carbon dioxide up away from the candle and that brings in fresh oxygen behind it, the, 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 the ignition will go out. And even though you do it with a match, that is actually an experiment my dad did on Skylab. Uh, and also, why on the space station, by the way, if the fire alarm goes off on the space station, the very first thing that it happens is all the fans get turned off. And that will generally put out any fire. And uh, uh, it's because of no air circulation. No oxidizer. Oh, and. So again, again, the point is that even people, uh, even amongst people who know pretty well, these are interesting, I think they're quite interesting questions that kids propose. And so now kind of the more kind of kitty question, but I still found interesting, um, was can you burp in space? Because if you think about the process of burping, separating the gases from the liquids in your stomach and, and, and expelling the gases, imagine trying to burp standing on your head. Do you think you could burp standing on your head? Uh, which I've never tried. But it was a reasonable question, and I thought, well, you know, in space, because the kid asked, you know, because will you be able to burp, or will you bring up fluid if you try to burp? And I said, I said, I actually don't know. I'll, I will find. I will report back. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious, how many people think you can burp successfully in space, just like you can on the Earth? How many people think that if you burp in space, you have trouble bringing up fluids? Okay. Well, it turns out they're both correct. It, it turns out. That just like your body adjusts to a wide variety of other things in microgravity, like your inner ear balance system corrects to understanding zero degree G after three days, the first few days you're in space, if you try to burp, you will burp up liquids. But after a few days, your body just figures it out. And it learns to squeegee the fluids down and only bring up gases out of your throat. And every, all my other crewmates had the same experience. And so I thought it was fascinating. That a, that, a, that a completely child, uh, you know, uh, proposed uh, query about space travel uh, ended up having, a, for, for me, what was kind of really an interesting result. Okay, so anyway, there's my questions for you guys. So uh, now, do you have do you, anything I, any questions I can answer? Yeah, back here toward the back. How are you spending most of your time? Uh, 
my time now, um, well, so it's interesting, the, the, the first 12 months after my flight was 100% traveling and talking like this to various groups. And what was interesting is, is the mix of groups that it represented. Um, you know, for example, a lot of times it's universities or colleges or you know, things of that nature. But I've also spoken at engineering safety conferences and things of this nature uh, that are you know, more serious or medical. I, it turns out I was a big medical guinea pig because of my anomalies that were rectified. You know, if you go become a government astronaut and there's anything physically wrong with you, they'll just boot you and take somebody else because they've got a million applicants you know, who are all potentially healthy. Um, if you're paying your own way, uh, they really would prefer to take your money than a movie. <laughs> but they still want you to survive the experience, so they make you go fix all these things. But it's still very rare to have people who have had any medical anomalies fly. And so, for example, um, you know the eyesight problem that prevented me from going in the first place? Well, I was one of the very first people ever to have photorefractive keratotomy, basically not LASIK, but an earlier form of laser eye surgery. And so I'm the first person who's ever flown in space who's had corrective eye surgery of any kind. And, uh, and so I became the, the guinea pig, because they were very interested to know how that, how that would, if that would be a problem, because your interocular eye pressure actually goes up by 20 to 50% while you're in space. And if you had a thin cornea like I have, it's reasonable to suspect it might affect your visual acuity. And so my eyes have been studied at an incredible level of detail. Um, and there's a wide variety of other medical things I've participated in through my flight. Uh, that have now been, are being published in a variety of medical journals, and I've also gone to speak at medical uh, events and things too. But for example, on the engineering safety one, you know, I have a slide, couple slides here on the end about, you know, uh, that, that, that are kind of left over from when I talked to engineering safety places about how and why I think that the Soyuz is so, and why it's so safe. Uh, that uh, you know, I think they've just done a phenomenally good job of engineering on, on the Soyuz. I think it's, it's very easy for us in America to look at the Soyuz and go. It's old, it's 30 years old, the reason why it's safe is because it's basically unchanged for 30 years, etc. Which is just not true. They build two at a time and they reiterate the, the, the pole line basically after every two that they build. And it's been constantly modernized and improved over time. It is a stunningly well-designed and well-built vehicle. But it's, but it's been achieved through very careful iteration over 30 years or 40 years. And, uh, um, and so they've, uh, that's how they achieve safety and, and revenue affordability. Right here. Uh, your vision for anyone who wants to go to space uh, can go eventually. So um, how does I mean, the medical prequalification <coughs> you mentioned, you know, very rigorous testing, very rigorous uh, requirements, do you foresee that being relaxed as more different types of vehicles and spacecraft? Or is there, or what percentage of the population is actually eligible from a health standpoint to go with Yeah, so, you, very interesting question. And so for suborbital flights, uh, if you can ride on a roller coaster, you can go suborbital. So that's, that won't be, a, that won't be a, a problem. Orbit is more medically challenging. And it's really for two primary areas. Uh, one, is, uh, uh, one is cardiovascular. So you really want to have, uh, the one thing you don't want to have is high blood pressure that's not medically treatable. If you have, if you can take medicine to keep your blood pressure under control, then you, then that's one major issue solved. The other uh, area is uh, this uh, vestibular challenge, which just really is a comfort challenge as much as anything else. And what's interesting is that one of the main reasons they only want to fly medically perfect people is because the only people they've ever flown are medically perfect people. And if you have any serious illness in space, it's really hard to get emergency medicine up there. In fact, you basically can't. So if you have a burst, a ruptured appendix or something, it's likely to be fatal uh, while you're in space. Or for me, this hemangioma, I didn't really explain what it was in my liver. Your liver has six lobes, a lobe being defined by one artery and one vein per lobe. And I had six arteries and five veins. And so I had one overpressured liver lobe. And so in the case of rapid depress of a spacecraft, could represent an increased probability of internal bleeding uh, that you would not be able to detect anyway. And even if you could detect it, you definitely can't fix it. And so it would be potentially fatal. But that would require a pretty good stream of unlikely events, if you know what I mean. Apparently about 10% of the population have these similar kinds of anomalies, but most people never know or care. You go through your whole life, you're born and die, and even you know, nobody bothers to even look that deep on an autopsy if you die naturally. And so most people just never know. Um, but you know, for going space, they scan you in great, great detail now. But as we begin to fly more and more private citizens, the medical database of what things actually were problems and what things turned out not to actually be a problem will become better and better known. 
And so the, the, the rules will become looser and looser. For example, you can now fly having, having had laser eye surgery. That's already been removed. And so uh, the, uh, uh, again, that's actually one of the benefits of flying private citizens like myself is that they're finding out the answers to these questions of what happens when you fly people who aren't medically perfect. Yeah? Yes, with the president's cancellate, uh, proposed cancellation, stop funding for constellation, some people such as Bert Rutan have said, wait, maybe it's better to have government go in parallel with private. Other people like uh, Buzz Aldrin have said, hey, I'm on board with this, I influence the president, we need to dump the moon, go straight to Mars. The, the students that came in through the International Space University and said, where is the, all these entrepreneurs that you listed? Where are their positions? Are they in there influencing the president with Buzz Aldrin? Uh, no, I actually think that the, those entrepreneurs are very separate. I mean, there's, there's an organization called the Commercial Space Flight Federation that includes SpaceX, Armadillo, uh, you know, most of these relatively small, relatively entrepreneurial, quote, commercial uh, you know, space flight groups. Um, and uh, th that group bound to be, you know, you know, kind of uh, formed to what I call represent this uh, growing new group. But I, uh, but I can tell you, I've been on conference calls with them. At the time, these like an asset screen, I think everybody was stunned. No one predicted it. No one had been pushing for it. Uh, there was, this was not, the, this was not what I'll call the fait accompli of, of that group of individuals. Okay. I think what, is, what happened was separate from that. It wasn't those, it wasn't the orphans of Apollo who went into private industry and the high-tech industries who have come back who are responsible for that. The group that is responsible, quote unquote, for it, I think, is the people who, who grew up uh, through organizations like SES and ISU, who then, as their first jobs, went into uh, many of the large prime contractors and or government sectors involved in space, who just grew up in a time where they were a little more what we call open-minded or different-minded than my dad's generation. For, you know, for my dad's generation, the only possibility was government funding, because it, it, it really was. I mean, there was no one who could undertake Apollo who didn't have the backing of the entire government. It, was, it would not have been remotely conceivable to, as a, to even consider starting. But, the, but this younger generation, I think, has grown up seeing the possibilities of privatization and therefore, in light of what I'll call budgetary realities, was willing to make that decision. But I, I, don't, I don't think the decision was easy to come by, by for anybody. And even amongst the commercial group that I was referring to, you're gonna still get mixed people. There's gonna be some people who go, yeah, we should still do it in parallel, or some people will say, well, no, skip it and move on ahead. I have mixed feelings on the subject too. I actually look at it and go, um, I completely believe the commercial guys will be able to pull this off. I completely believe that uh, it will be the cheapest and fastest way to get even to the moon, personally. Um, that being said, you know, um, as a risk management strategy, it would have been mighty nice to still have Constellation going, and, you know, I'd sure like to see us get back to the moon and or Mars and or asteroids as soon as possible. And so, I, I'm really fundamentally in favor of whatever gets us there the fastest. And if this is, if, if the budgetary reality is we can't afford Constellation, which is, is not necessarily a, a statement I can say with confidence, <coughs> but if that's the assumption or the policy statement, then I think doing hard science with some of that money and, and, and spurring on the commercial development is really is a great way to go. Um, you know, something I was, I'd even said before, before this decision came down, I, have a, I spent one day, my, my only day I've ever been on Capitol Hill going into congressional offices and senatorial offices. And the thing that I was there to talk about was I, at the time, was saying, look, the way to make sure, you know, what we really need is competition. And we already have competition in, say, satellite launch. But the way that Orbiter has been built, for good reason, because it was built in the same way we built the follow-up, for good reason, is NASA goes, hey, I need, a, I need the ability to, you know, I need a space shuttle. And so they chop, they task it out. They get the Orbiter from Boeing, they get the uh, solid rocket boosters from Morton Tackle, they get them from. Yeah, yeah, from Thank you. And, uh, and they get other parts from other people, but then they assemble it themselves, they launch it themselves. And already I was saying, look, if you just changed it, take the same money, Call it a billion dollars. Take the same billion dollars, give it all to one of the big primes called Boeing, 
and say, hey, Boeing, you distribute it to all the other primes, the same people. So all the same billion dollars goes to exactly the same paychecks to exactly the same staff. But you buy it, if I was NASA, as a launch service for Boeing or whoever, or some new company. Well, that would mean, and you, you contract with them for five launches. Well, that means for the next five launches, if somebody else, some other upstart comes up here and says, hey, I can provide you those next five launches for half that price. Well, that means the first company better figure out a way to get a little more efficient or or, quite, you know, or, or have better service or better capabilities or, or whatever else. It takes it to the same competitive scope as everything else. So the thing that I think is great about, quote, commercial is competition, uh, and it, which will bring on price savings and innovation. I don't think it was necessary to stop one to get the other fundamentally. What I do think what is really important, though, is changing that procurement method. Is to is that everything you know? NASA should buy even human access to space as a launch service, uh, and that way they have the choice of of changing horses if they wish, versus being permanently devoted to any one solution. Is my personal opinion. Yes. Um, I think in the slides that you were showing before your presentation, you showed some pictures that it looked like you did art. I did. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So what's interesting is you know my mother's an artist. They gave me the other kind of half of my uh, creative side of my technical, in contrast to my technical side. And so I wanted to do something artistic in space, but I'm actually not a good artist. And so I thought if I go into space and just make a drawing in space, this is going to be a bad drawing that somebody drew in space. And so I sat back and said, okay, how can I do art in space that uses microgravity in a relevant way to the result in a way that you really couldn't duplicate it? On the Earth, so another microgravity, in a sense, required uh, through the uh, through that creation. And so what I did is, you may have seen a picture of a plastic glove box. I then put uh, watercolor paper on all the internal surfaces, and watercolor watercolor paper is slightly hydrophobic; uh, it, it resists absorbing the water. It's not like a sponge; that the water will bead on it. And then I carefully released drops of paint into the glove box, which, of course, you can't release it without imparting some velocity on the paint. So basically, I put random dots of paint, you know, droplets of paint into a glove box that randomly found their ways, drifted onto the paper. And when they did, they, they were, since the paper is hydrophobic, it beaded on the surface of the paper. And then I left it still for six days. And so those little beads dried out. And so they tended to flatten out. I didn't know exactly what they do. They did tend to flatten out. But they're actually dimensional raisinets of paint on canvas. And my dad looks like it was, looks like mold growing on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I think I named one of the six that I made. I think it's called the you know, moldy paper or something <laughs> after my dad. Um, but the point was to try to create something that even though, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's profoundly uh, profound art, but it is art that at a microscopic level it is not reproducible on the earth. Yes, back here. How do we <clears throat> well, I, I, but I think it's interesting about that is that, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, those of us who are close enough to space to see it on a regular basis, we are still absolutely inspired by space. I mean, all of us, that's why we're, you know, living or working or playing or listening to me tonight, uh, is because we get it. But, you know, it's, I think it's, it's not, it's, it's easy to understand. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's easy to, you know, to recognize the truth of why even though CNN, you know, uh, you know, broadcasts every shuttle launch, even I personally often don't know when a shuttle launches. I mean, the, I would say the vast majority of times the shuttle launches, I find out about it 24 to 48 hours after the fact. Um, the, uh, and of course the general populace is much further removed even than that. Even than that. And, and that's because we've so far been in a, a period of repetition. And anything that you can do repeatedly is, is uninteresting until there's an emergency, which goes back to Apollo 13, goes back to, uh, goes back to Challenger, goes back to Columbia. I mean, uh, those are the moments, sadly, when suddenly everybody pays attention. But the other time that people really pay attention is when there's something different going on. And one of the things I think is really cool about this stuff is that I assure you, when, when these guys start flying that to space, people are gonna pay attention. Especially when that some other thing looks like that, and uh, I missed my version one in here somewhere. But uh, you know, when, and when, when these people, when there's 
five different solutions that people can fly to space, people are going to pay attention during that period of, say, five years. So we're going to have a window of five years, where, which I call this barnstorming era, where suddenly people are going to pay attention to it again. And by the way, some of it's going to be because really cool things are happening. There's a reasonable probability there's going to be some really bad things that will happen during the same period, by the way. There's, there's reasonably probable there's going to be some really glorious failures, and you know, deadly failures, potentially. And what's interesting about that is that when we have a government-sponsored space program that is only flying national government heroes, the you know, 500 in the world, and think about the US, some 250, I'll call it. And what is the number of US flown astronauts? Yeah, Richard? Uh, 384. 400, sorry. 384. So, you know, just under 400 of, of the people in space are US national heroes. When a tragedy happens with US national heroes, it's a, you know, the world stops. We spend two years analyzing why. For, you know, good emotional reasons as a country. When you have some Yahoo barnstormer who bought himself a space plane and <laughs> hot rod, hot rod the back end of it and blew up, you go, well, there's Darwin at work. <laughs> but it still makes the news. But, but it's not a national crisis. It's because it's, you know, because it's a self-inflicted wound, you know, so to speak. And so it's, it's a little more, I believe the public reaction will be quite a bit different. And so I think this barnstorming era will still captivate positively people's attention for all the right reasons. And I don't think the negatives, if they should occur, will be nearly as uh, stopping or, you know, won't, won't be a train wreck. It won't stop progress uh, like it has uh, when, when it's so few and far between in the first place. Well, going from the world of missiles to the world of manned space and looking at the extra cost and time it takes to man rate a vehicle, <coughs> uh, certainly this vehicle you're showing here does not look man rated. And I think I just heard you say that we're not going to worry about man rating vehicles in the future. And these commercial people are going to kill whoever they do, and it's going to be OK. No, no, I actually think they will be man rated. So, so please don't, don't misunderstand that. I, I think these absolutely have to be man rated. I know for a fact Dragon will never carry a person until it's man rated. The first people who use it, the first humans that use it, presumably would be NASA astronauts. But once it's man rated, because it's commercial, I assure you, I'm going to go buy one. Because I can. I mean, if I had the money, NASA would never sell me a shovel. But if NASA buys from Dragon, I can buy from Dragon too, because it's commercial. And that's, what, that's kind of one of my key definitions of what the definition of commercial is. Is that, yes, it's man rated by NASA standards, and it, no human will fly it until it meets that standard. And then I'll buy one too. And, uh, but by the way, uh, what I was trying to say though, is as a general rule, because I believe that, uh, if, I, if I go back to my X course slide, um, you know, because I believe that every high school and college shop that can compete in robotics competitions can also build rockets. Now I'm not saying you should give them a launch license. I'm not saying you should give them the right to go kill themselves in a plane. I'm just saying we are now in an era where it's possible. And since it's possible, the FAA is already, I think, taking a very good stance on launch licenses. Where, for example, as Armadillo gets higher and higher and higher, the FAA basically says, whatever you do, if your vehicle blows up, the one thing you cannot do is kill people on the ground because they are innocent bystanders. But test pilots, and even for the military, test pilots knowingly face more risk. And that should be true for government test pilots as well as private test pilots. But it should not be available to the general public, and to my knowledge, there is no one has any intention of them being available to the general public until they're completely man -rated. But by the way, government test pilots have died in the process of certifying vehicles. And it's reasonably probable that that might occur in the commercial era also. I think. Yeah. Did you ever approach NASA for trying to buy a, buy a commercial flight or early we on? We did Space Adventures. So what's funny is, um, um, you know, when we, we started the XPRIZE and Space Adventures at the same time, the theory was XPRIZE is going to help bring into existence suborbital vehicles, and Space Adventures was sell seats on those suborbital vehicles. Um, but it took us almost a decade to raise the $10 million prize. And so during that period of time, no one was competing for the prize that didn't exist. And so here we had Space Adventures going, 
we're going like, okay, well, we've got a company and we're taking people to Russia on zero G flights, we're doing some big flights, but we're not seeing anybody in the space. And since there's no vehicle, we really can't. And we said, well, you know, there's actually two companies that do fly space, NASA and RSA, Russian Space Agency. So let's go find out. And so we actually can go ask. And of course, what's interesting is in both cases, we actually did first answer is no. We had to ask NASA, NASA, can we buy a civilian seat? The answer is no. And but even though it wasn't stated, in my mind, you know, it's easy to reflect on the fact that for NASA, there is no price they can charge here in America that would be seen as fair market value for a, a commercial seat on a shuttle. Because we've, as a nation, we've invested so much money in it, that even if we charge a billion dollars for that seat, it would still be seen by the general public as, there's some rich Yahoo who's getting a fringe benefit that has been made out of my tax money. And I believe that's how the public really would react. And so I actually think that NASA's correct answer is, no, we just can't do that. It's not, it's not, it doesn't work within the schema of how we've constructed our agency. Interestingly, when we asked Russia, Russia's first answer, first answer was also no. But the answer came with a caveat. It was no, because to find out if it would be possible, how we would train those people, how, uh, you know, what the constraints would be on the limits of flying, how much it would cost. That would all cost us a lot of money and effort to even go find out the answer. And well, I'm like, well, that's not no, that's just a qualified yes. And so we actually, actually I paid for the study to find out what the price was, and I intend to be that first customer, and like I told you, that's when, after we got the answer, and I really planned to be the first, that's when we ended up stock market first, and I had to sell my seat. But, uh, <coughs> um, but what's interesting is if you go in Russia and you go ask any person on the street, what do you think of the fact that wealthy foreigners are buying seats on your national spacecraft? Again, like I said, I really think the public against the United States would be that's ridiculous and, 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 and you're utilizing something I paid for in an unfair way. I can tell you what the answer on the street in Russia is because I've asked this myself, being one of those people. And to a person in Russia, people go, we are so proud that a foreigner has enough faith in our space program to pay fair market value for that seat and risk their life on the back of our technology. We think it's great that every dollar they pay, I don't have to pay in taxes. We think it's great that it, that it really showcases the fact that the Russian space program is a leading space program and is the cost-effective and safety winner, which by the way, it is the cost-effective and safety winner. And so, uh, uh, and so I'm, you know, very pleased to go ride there on the vehicle. I'd go ride on the vehicle every day they would let me. But, uh, 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 but, uh, but anyway, it, it's, it's interesting to contrast socially what the real difference, the differences between a Russian reaction and an American reaction. <coughs> to your question. <coughs> yeah? Uh, NASA has thought for some time that uh, it can develop one of these massive uh, game programs like you've developed, that that would be a good way to get uh, young people that what do you think of that and what kind of a program would you foresee? Yeah, and I know the group that is actually working on a NASA space-based MMO, and uh, and so uh, uh, you know, there's, it's something I've thought about. I mean, it's, it's obviously core to my business, so I've given this one a fair bit of thought. What's interesting about the games industry is, here's the good and the bad of the games industry. It's the good and the bad of the games industry, the good of the games industry is that it is now basically the biggest entertainment uh, sector that exists. It's considerably larger now than the movie industry. The movie industry still gets much more glitz and glamour, Hollywood style, but from an economic driver, the games industry is by far dominant. The bad news is that of the thousand or so games that are produced every year, there are only exactly 10 that make money. All 990 others lose money. And that's true of movies and books and games. Creative industries tend to be things where for the, for the love of art, people are willing to throw their lives behind it without regard to whether it returns for them financially. And, uh, and so to get in the top 10, which I try to do with every one of my games, is actually really, really hard. I, I as often as not, don't make it in the top 10. Half my games don't make money. But I have about a 50-50 track record, which is about as good as anybody has ever had in this, in this industry. If you go to anybody who's trying to get in that top 10 and say, <clears throat> hey, by the way, we want to not only make something that is self-sufficient, at least pays for itself uh, by some form of revenue, but also has to have an educational component or your has to be realistic space versus fantasy space. 
you're, you're, you're changing fundamentally the competitive dynamic and you're making it dramatically harder to make something that is even reasonably self-sufficient. And if you decide to make a game that's not self-sufficient, that means you're gonna pump a bunch of money into it. And so the challenge of making a game that fulfills, that fulfills that vision, I think is stunningly high. But do I think it's worthwhile? Potentially, yes. But uh, uh, but but for me, it's uh, it's it's not a it's not an it's not an easy yes. It's a very hard fought possibility. Yes, you. But now that you have spoken around the world for the last year, what extra things have you grown or learned about, reflected on? <coughs> yeah. So what's interesting is you know I mentioned that seeing the Earth from space is a life changing event. Uh, and for me, it absolutely is. Uh, for example, even though I would have always described myself as an environmentalist, and my number one charities were things like the Nature Conservancy, which I find a great apolitical way to donate money that acquires land and puts it into uh, good stewardship um, uh, in a, well, again, an apolitical way. If you look at my personal lifestyle, I have been historically been one of the biggest abusers of natural resource that has existed on the safe face of the earth. Um, you know, I have a 6,000 square foot house that uses so much electricity, I had to have two separate coal line drops to provide the amperage that I needed. Uh, I had seven cars, a number of gas guzzling SUVs and a number of high-end you know, sports cars that you know, wasted plenty of energy. Uh, I still have seven roll-off trash cans that I roll the street every year because I acquire so much stuff that I have that much trash, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I've done since I've gotten back, however, is I've said, look, I really have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, but I've got to live the experience. And so, for example, I've reinstated my entire house. I converted all my lighting over to LED. I'm in the middle of installing enough solar around my house to accumulate a one-to-one -one offset on a 24-hour basis. So I plan to go to energy net zero. And it's not cheap. I'm not saying it's the cost-effective thing to do. It just feels to me like an important thing to do because I can afford to be an early adopter, and so I ought to be. And the same thing too, I got sold all the, all the cars I had, I sold except two old Model T's. And, uh, and I'm in the middle of building my own plug-in electric, just because I think it's a fun project, and I think there's still potentially some low-hanging fruit that, strangely, Detroit hasn't dominated yet, uh, and uh, has allowed people like Elon to come in and become a true leader in that area, uh, when Detroit should have been leading in this area from the get-go. Um, and uh, you know, these sorts of things. So it really, it really has completely changed the things I find important. For example, one of the businesses that I'm starting up, uh, and this takes too long to explain here, but uh, uh, it's something called personal rapid transit. Uh, is a form of, you know, I, I think public transit in buses and trains is basically non-functional, and, uh, and I think a better schema exists, and for me that's called personal rapid transit. And uh, if you go look that up, you'll know see Austin PRT, which is my company, but you'll see others around the world that are doing this, and I think it is a, a great uh, public transit uh, solution for the future that saves a bunch of energy as well as as a superior service. But anyway, so I think uh, we're about out of time there. So uh, again, I'll say thank you all very much. I sure enjoyed being here today.